Hi everyone, welcome back to another Factual Fingers episode. My name is Brock. Today I'm going to be reading a short story on the No Sleep subreddit. Today's story is called, People Always Use My Driveway to Turn Around. A few days ago, someone pulled in and didn't leave. It happens all the time, and I can't help but find it irritating. I live on the outskirts of town less than a mile away from a busy highway, and people pull into my driveway at all hours of the day. It always makes me nervous, wondering if someone is dropping by unannounced, only to see them sit at the end for a moment before reversing out and driving away. It's most unsettling at night, seeing the headlights cut through the trees in my front yard while they sit there. It makes me wonder if someone's scoping my house out, like they're thinking of robbing me. I park my car in the garage so it always looks like I'm not home. In the end, they always drive away, and I'm left feeling foolish at someone's lack of directions. A few days ago, however, someone pulled in and didn't leave. I stood and watched them from the window of my living room. Peeking out through the blinds, the car sat there suspiciously, idling at the end of the driveway. I thought maybe they were lost and checking the GPS on their phone, trying to figure out where they missed a turn. I try not to be a total jerk about it and give them time to figure out where they're going before jumping to conclusions, but it was after 11 o'clock at night and not only were they interrupting my movie, they were weeding me out. When the car stayed there for 5 more minutes, I started to get worried. I raised the blind and started waving to see if I could get some kind of reaction. The car continued to idle there, a faint trail of exhaust rising in the chilly night. Nobody turned on the dome light, nobody got out, nothing. I just stood there watching, wondering if I should go out there, or call the police. Dialing 911 seemed a little ridiculous without even going out and seeing first, so I did something I really didn't want to do. I went to see why they were sitting there. I put on my shoes and pulled on a jacket. I brought my phone for light or in case I needed to help them call a tow truck or something. I thought the best case scenario was maybe they got a flat tire and their phone had died and they were just too nervous to knock on my door. Like I said, it was after 11 and knocking on someone's door at that hour could be just as shady as watching them sit at the end of my driveway. Against my better judgement, I stepped outside. I could hear the engine running in the distance, along with a few chorus crickets chirping in the night. It took me a few seconds to get the courage to walk out there. The driveway is pretty long and it's really dark. Everything feels scary in the middle of the night, especially with no neighbours close by. I swallowed hard and started walking, keeping my eyes on the car as I walked over. I turned on the flashlight function on my phone and tried to keep a steady pace on the way. Gravel crunched under my feet and my palms started to sweat. Maybe they were drunk and fell asleep. Maybe it was a couple of young kids lost on a late night out. When I got about 20 feet away, I got a sick feeling in my stomach. Something felt off, especially when I could see the driver behind the wheel. They were only just looking at me, like they were frozen. I could only faintly make out their eyes, a pale visage within the darkness of the front seat. Hello? I asked aloud, trying not to sound as nervous as I was. No response. The driver didn't even blink. I took a couple of steps closer, trying to see if there was anyone else in there with them. The urge to call the police itched at me more the closer I got. You lost? This is private property. I called out again, the features in the driver's face looking more unsettling the closer I got. I could only see their eyes, their nose. Why couldn't I see anything else? Why weren't they moving? The headlights were blinding, making it hard to see. I kept pushing forward, holding up a hand to try and block so I could see. I had no choice but to get closer and try to get around to the driver's side to get a better look. More crunching footsteps and their car getting louder. The driver didn't move a muscle, didn't motion to me or anything. I realized I was holding my breath, the anxiety welling within me as I approached. The driver looked like a woman, her hands in front of her, holding the wheel, but it was so dark in there, I couldn't see her hands, only the unmoving stare. A strong feeling of foreboding radiated from the eerie car, and my body begged to turn around and run back to the house. Something was wrong, very, very wrong. 
I walked around to the front of the vehicle, to the driver's side, and held up my flashlight to see them. They didn't turn to look at me. They didn't do anything. My eyes slowly calibrated what was in front of me, and when it finally pieced together, I wanted to scream. The woman was dead, her lifeless eyes frozen on my house, unable to look away. Her throat had been slashed, and the entire car was spattered with blood. Duct tape was everywhere, a single wrap across her forehead to hold her head in place, a strip over her mouth so she couldn't speak, and several tight binds around her wrists to keep them to the steering wheel. Her hands had been removed. I called the police, frantically looking everywhere as the world seemed to be caving in on me. An operator picked up immediately, and through my terrified ramble, I subconsciously took in the scene as I explained what was happening. There was nobody in the back seat, and no sign of anyone leaving. I started to panic more, looking in the trees, and back towards my house, expecting to see someone watching. But there was nobody else, nobody except for me and the butchered woman. The operator instructed me to go back up inside and lock the door until help arrived. I sprinted back up to the front door, the sound of my own footsteps haunting me as I made my way back. Once inside, I slammed the door and locked it, flinching at every sound as the voice on the line tried to keep me quiet. My heart raced so hard in my chest that I thought I would have a heart attack. The police arrived in less than two minutes. One car at first with an officer getting out of the vehicle with a gun drawn, then another, then two more. The fire department was next, and the wailing siren bled into the barrage of lights that lit up my entire house. It didn't feel safe to be there, even after officers came in and searched the house and scoured the entire property. They didn't find anyone, and the killer didn't leave anything behind. The days that followed blurred together. I had to take some time off work. Between the questioning and my driveway turning into a crime scene, I couldn't go anywhere if I tried. I didn't sleep much, but between the police, a lawyer, and the news crews, I wasn't alone for a while. They searched everything, the basement, the attic, the woods behind my house. They even looked up in the crawl space to see if they were held up in there. There was no evidence left behind, no inclination of where they went either. The killer was never found. I didn't learn much about the woman I found, other than they suspect she was picked up at random on her way home from work. Eventually things went back to normal, and I was allowed to go back to work. It was a relief to get out of the house, even after they towed that poor woman's car away. I couldn't help but think of it every time I looked outside. Getting into town and back behind my desk was a welcome distraction, and once I was able to busy my mind, it was easy to pretend it was all just a bad dream. That was until I was driving home last night. I was about halfway home when I started noticing an odour, like I had driven past some roadkill. I tried rolling up the windows and it got worse, a heavy rotting smell that made me gag. I realised it was something inside the car. When I pulled over to find it, I looked under the seats and in the trunk, thinking maybe I had left out some raw meat from the last time I went shopping. I didn't find anything and I found myself scratching my head at a loss, until I looked at the glove box and saw it was leaking. When I hit the button and opened it, the scent exploded into the cab, along with a cloud of buzzing flies. Stuffed inside the glove box was the pair of the woman's hands, decomposed and swelling against the duct tape that wrapped around them.